Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 7, I wanted to do a quick video. I always say quick, but it depends on how long God showed me some things to show with you, get, share with you guys. But I've seen that uh, Matthew 7 chapter 6 is being misused a lot. And we need to get the context and we need to go over it and let's do another Bible study again. That's the best way to do it. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 7 verse 1, let's get started. It says, Judge not that you be not judged. So we're talking about judgment, but we're talking about hypocritical judgment as we keep going. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure she meet, it shall be measured to you again. As a Bible-believing Christian, this is how we judge. We judge ourselves with this, with the Word of God, the perfect written Word of God, the King James Bible for English-speaking people. Okay? We hold ourselves accountable to it, and we hold the brethren accountable to it. It's, a, it's a, a foundation, a standard, in which we can hold everybody accountable to. Okay? So this is saying that if I judge you according to this book, that means I can be judged according to this book. But if I judge you and get you for what you're doing, but I'm doing the same thing, I don't, no, don't, don't judge me. That's what this is saying. Whatever judgment I judge, it's going to be met back to me. So if I'm judging according to this book, it's going to come back to me. If you're telling someone else they shouldn't be doing something that you're doing, it's going to come back on you. That same judgment. Okay? Verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. See? Talk about hypocr hypocritical judgment. Verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eyes. Thy brother's eye. Okay? So there it goes and says, okay, you can judge, but you judge righteous judgment. The Bible talks about not judge according to the flesh, but judge righteous judgment. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Okay, we are to judge righteous judgment. But before I can help you, brothers and sisters in Christ, I need to look at myself first and say, do I have a problem with it? Before I go to you guys. If I did have a problem with it, does God got it, help me get it? Like we're going to get into this study. I failed and did wrong a little bit as I was uh, a lot, actually, when I was newly saved. But God's helped me correctly uh, interpret, interpret, correctly read verse 6. Okay, and apply it to my life properly. But there's still brethren out there that are misteaching this verse. Okay. But that's what it's talking about. Look at yourself first, and once you've got, got your life, got that sin, or that sin out of your life, or if it's something you're supposed to be doing for God, it's a commandment of God to do, and you're not doing it, make sure I'm doing it first before I tell somebody else they have to do it. Make sure I'm not doing it if I'm going to tell somebody else they're not supposed to be doing it when it comes to sin. Okay. That's the type of judgment it's talking about. But then we get into verse 6, and I've, I've had brethren misuse this verse. Okay, so let's read it. Verse 6. Give not that which is unholy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given, seek, given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. It's starting to picture a man that's seeking truth. If somebody wants truth, they want pearls, another way of saying wisdom, as we're going to get into this study. Holy, give not what's this holy unto the dogs. It's the commandments of God. That's what holy means. Okay, when it said, be ye holy as I am holy, talking about the Lord, God Almighty, Jesus Christ, be ye holy as I am holy, what's it talking about? Jesus was sinless. He kept the commands of God. Now, we're not going to be sinlessly perfect, but our heartfelt desire is to be ye holy as I am holy. I'm supposed to do my best to obey the commands that God gives me. Okay, but it's talking about here that those that are seeking it, We'll find it. Everyone that asketh receiveth. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, what am I doing wrong in my life? Is there sin in my life that I need to get out of my life? Lord, what do I need to do? There's someone who's seeking wisdom. There's someone who's seeking the commandments of God. 
And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Okay. Now let's go back to verse 6. I just had to point that and we kept going because it's talking about people that are truly seeking wisdom. Proverbs 23, 23, 23. If you want to turn there. Buy the truth and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. What's sad is when you see a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman start to sell the truth. Okay? Buy the truth and sell it not. Hold on to the truth. Don't let it go. Okay? But it says, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. So bottom line is saying, buy the truth and sell it not. Buy wisdom and sell it not. Buy instruction and sell it not. Buy understanding and sell it not. So we go here, what's it talking about? Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools do. The lost world. We're going to get into it, but it talks about dogs and sows referring to false converts, but they're lost. Okay? They're lost. This is a picture of someone who's lost, a swine, a dog. It's someone who is lost, and you're trying to force feed them pearls. Wisdom. You're trying to force feed them the commandments of God. What's the number one commandment? I'm getting ahead of myself, but the number one commandment for a Christian today is what? Obey the gospel. What happens to them who obey not the gospel? They go to hell and burn for all eternity. So the number one command for a Christian today and for the lost world is obey the gospel. Let God save you. Come to Him repenting of your sins, having sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. Believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. God manifest in the flesh. It was God that died on the cross. It was God's blood that was spilled on the cross. He died to pay for my sins. Now I wanted my sins forgiven. My sins are paid for, but they're not forgiven. I now owe a debt to Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I can't. I can't pay that debt. There's nothing in my hands I bring. You go to the cross to get forgiveness, to get your sins washed away. You confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. That's obeying the gospel. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I don't deserve to be saved. Lord, please save me. You ask showing that you don't deserve it. You didn't earn it. And if anybody tells you you don't ask for salvation, it's because they felt they've earned it. And it always gets on my nerves that, I get, are we really supposed to ask? So did you earn it? Well, no, then you ask. That shows you didn't earn it. But we have wisdom and instruction. Okay, You're force-feeding pearls, wisdom, to lost people. You're force-feeding the commandments of God to lost people. And when you try to force-feed an animal that's all fleshly, remember Romans chapter 8. Spiritually minded, walking after the Spirit. That's what you're supposed to be as a Christian. Before you got saved, you were carnally minded, walking after the flesh. That's what the animals do. That's why it likens them to animals. That's what they're all about the flesh. They don't want wisdom. They don't want holiness. They don't want command the holy commands of God. Okay. Bottom line, what this passage is saying is you're feeding them something they don't want. Someone, a brother in Christ tried to use this to justify, you know, you have Christians that do want wisdom, they do want the commandments of God, and then they don't turn around and they don't donate to the ministry. That's not what this passage is talking about at all. That's a whole other subject that you can use other verses. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. When it comes to food and raiment, we should be helping men in ministry. Absolutely. Okay? The, with food and raiment, therewith be content. Paul talks about with every, whatever state I'm in, therewith be content. Sometimes he had to live in a state of being very poor. Sometimes he had a little bit of stuff. Sometimes he might have had an abundance. But whatever it was, depending on the life and where he was going and God was calling him, he learned to be content with whatever state he's in. Okay? But that's a whole nother discussion. Trying to grab this verse 
to try to use it to get people to donate to ministries. That's not what this verse is talking about. Not even close. Okay? This is talking about, brethren, how many times have you gotten into a debate and an argument with someone you found out later was lost, and you probably should have known they were lost to begin with within the first few minutes of the conversation, but you wasted two or three hours with them, debating and arguing Scripture with them. That's what this verse is talking about. You're trying to show truth to somebody who doesn't want the truth. They don't want wisdom. They don't want instruction. They don't want the commandments of God. When you realize that you're dealing with a false convert, I've always preached this, when you're dealing with a false convert, what do you do? You preach the plan of salvation to them and you move on. You don't get into arguments and debates and fellowship with lost people. Okay, there's one thing if you guys disagree and you're really going through the scriptures and you can get heated contentions where you're disagreeing and you need to take a break and take a breather because you realize it's turning into a debate, not a discussion. It's turning into an argument, not a discussion. And you need to step back and take a, and take a breather with someone you think is really saved. But mainly, I, when I was newly saved, I was getting into debates and arguments. I was linking scripture after scripture, and they were linking their feelings and opinions. And that's the biggest thing about them, is feelings and opinions. They don't link scripture. But sometimes they will. You come across people that will pick and choose stuff out of scripture. Okay, They'll grab one little thing that makes it... I, you can cut up the Bible and get it to say whatever you want it to say. If you don't compare scripture with scripture and make sure you're reading the entire context that that verse comes from. And there's brethren that are failing to do that too. They'll grab something just to prove a point and then when you read the whole chapter you realize their whole point just falls apart. But the point of this is animals will rend you. They're fleshly. You're not giving them what they want. You see those video games? That's sin. You need to give that up. They'll turn around and rend you. The lost world will. Uh, alcohol, drunkenness. That's a sin. Uh, fornication. Hollywood movies and TV shows. Satanic style music. Okay, Holidays. They're all fleshly. When you actually look into almost, oh, I have to say, 90 to 95% of all holidays, which is man-ordained, man-commanded. See, holy days... Holy. Remember that word holy? Holy. You know what it means? Be ye holy as I am holy? The holy commands of God. You're doing your best to keep the commands of God. Okay, holy day is you're keeping the commandment of God. He tells you there's a specific day that I want you to keep and I'm going to tell you how to keep it. And I'm going to tell you the consequences for not keeping it. I'll tell you why to keep it. It's a whole other study we'll be getting into after this one. Okay. But the holy commands of God... You're trying to force feed that to the lost world, and they just want to be flesh fed, flesh fed, flesh fed. A good example of this is I used to walk down to the horse ranch that we have a few blocks down the road. I call it blocks, but it's a dirt road. I live out here on the mountainside. But you go down past a few properties, which is more than a block, because a lot of the properties around here are five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres each. Um, but by the time you walk down there, I used to carry carrots with me because I asked the owner, is it okay if I feed the one carrot every day to the horses? And she's like, yeah, you can do that. So it was a blessing from the Lord. I got to walk down. It was a good walk. Beautiful trees. We're out here on the mountainside. And you walk down to the horse ranch, and I was giving them carrots every day. Well, I'd walk down in the evenings also, not just in the mornings. So I'd give them a carrot in the morning, and I'd walk down in the evenings. And when I'd walk in to see how they're doing, because it's just a blessing to see the horse ranch and everything. And um, I remember I also helped clean the stalls once for my daughter to uh, be able to get free riding lessons. Because uh, I couldn't afford riding lessons and everything. And so I did some work and I got to be around the animals and got to learn a little bit about horses and what it takes to take care of the horses. But there was one of the horses there that every time I walked by, he would start stomping his feet. Why is that? I'm not trying to hit the Bible, sorry. He's stomping his feet. And it's like, what's going on? Well, he wants his carrot. I go over there and say, I, I pet him a little bit. I'm going to pet you a little bit. No, he shakes his head. No, I want my carrot. But I'm not giving you a carrot right now. Here, here's some hay. 
No, I want my carrot. And he stomped his feet. Have you ever seen those videos where animals will bite their owners because they're not giving them the treat that they want? Kind of like rending them? They want to be fed the flesh when they want to be fed what they want to be fed. That's the whole point of this, okay? So what are some examples of people doing that in the Bible, casting pearls before swine, and they get rended? Uh, turn to Matthew 14, 1. Let's go to John the Baptist. What happened to John the Baptist? At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had, Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Why wasn't it lawful? Well, if you look into it, it doesn't say, but when you look in the Old Testament, if your brother had, if she had children by the brother to raise up seed, sons from their brother, and the brother dies, she's to, marry, she's to remain a widow. You're not to marry her. Now, if she had no seed, you're to marry her and bring seed up to your brother. Now, we don't do that today, but that's how it was back then. So John... The commandments of God, quoting the commandments of God, told him he's not allowed to have his brother's wife. She's already got children. She's got a son. She might be a widow where she's past the point where you're not supposed to have her. I don't know, but the point is, is you go, it doesn't give the specifics, but for some reason, and John was a righteous man, he had the Holy Spirit in him, there was an old law stating that you couldn't have her. It was a commandment of God. And he told them that you couldn't. And what was the consequences for casting pearls before swine? Someone who didn't want the commandment of God. For, son, for John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Verse 5. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Okay, we can keep reading that. But the point is, is he put cast pearls before swine. They didn't want something that was holy. Remember holy? The holy commands of God. That's what it's talking about there when it says, Cast not that which is holy unto the dogs. The holy commands of God. Nor cast ye pearls before swine. Wisdom, instruction, understanding. Is what that pearl represents. Here's an example. He tells him, What you're doing is wrong. And what did it cost John? He got thrown into prison. And if it wasn't for the fact that Herod feared the people, Herod would have killed him. Casting your pearls before swine. What happens? They will turn around and rend you. Now, now understand, he's supposed to preach the law to everybody. The Jewish people. Understand that. But here's an example of someone preaching the command of God and it coming back on him. Now, don't get me wrong. John's like, I would have preached it again and again and again. I wouldn't have done it differently. Standing for the God's word. But for today, when it comes to the lost world... You can't force the lost world to obey this book. You can't. John could not force that man to obey. Okay. What about Peter? Simon Peter. What about Peter? Acts 12.1. Turn to Acts 12.1. Read all the way down to 7. Okay. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now here's the thing. Herod, it's like, unless God told me in a dream, go preach the gospel to Herod, I wouldn't be preaching the gospel to Herod. You already know he doesn't want it. Same thing with the Pope today. It's like, go preach the gospel to the Pope. God wouldn't tell us that. He doesn't want it. Mm -hmm. What happens? I get killed. Verse 3. 
And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quartor... I can't even pronounce that. Quaternions of soldiers. Quaternions of soldiers. To keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. After Easter. How do we know Easter's the right reading? Well, when you go back up to verse 3, it says, Then were the days of unleavened bread. No, it's supposed to be Passover. Do the days of unleavened bread come before Passover or after Passover? When they try to attack the King James Bible, just ask him, was Herod supposed to wait a whole nother year before dealing with Peter and bringing him forth? Was he planning on holding Peter for a whole nother year? Well, if they're not totally off the rocker, if you want to say it like that, they'll say, no, he wasn't. Well, then Easter's the right reading. Passover already came. You have Passovers one day, and then you have the days of unleavened bread that follow it. Okay. Easter's the right reading. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was, was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains... And the keeper before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord, I believe it's Jesus, came upon him and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Okay. Now you keep reading this. Rise up. Okay. Now go preach to hear Herod. You realize Herod doesn't want the truth. He doesn't want the commandments of God. He doesn't want wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Does he tell him to go back to Herod? No. We already know that Herod's killed James. He's killing Christians. He wants nothing to do with Christians. We don't preach to him. Okay? People say, what about Paul? Okay. Paul, God had to shine a light on him and blind him to wake him up. God had to intervene. Okay? He was killing Christians too. When he was Saul, before he became Paul. It took God intervening. Okay? But was Peter going to cast his pearls before swine? Before dogs? Herod? No. Herod's killing Christians. He goes back to the brethren, and he goes back to preaching. There's one, I don't know if I put this one in here. Uh, there's one where they get broke out of prison, and they get told to go back and preach to the people. They didn't get told, go preach to those people that put you in jail. Go cast your pearls before swine. No. He got, they got told to go preach to the people that did want the truth and did was listening. Right. He said, well, what's the big deal for this whole study? Well, they're trying to, I have brethren trying to grab that verse and then use it for trying to get people to donate to ministries. And that's not what that verse is about at all. It's about if somebody wants the truth and has a love of the truth, they want wisdom, they want instruction, they want understanding. It doesn't matter if I get one penny or a million dollars. You keep preaching that truth to that brother or sister in Christ. It's not about money. That verse has nothing to do with money whatsoever. Okay? And like I said, I do believe that there are ministries that deserve, if you've learned something from a ministry... By all means, you need to be donating if God's blessed you with a little bit of extra money to ministries that have blessed you. But as a, pa as a person who's preaching the Word of God, it's not about money. It's about preaching the Word of God and seeing fruit. If I'm preaching to these people and there's no fruit, I need to go over here and start preaching to these people. Oh, there's fruit. Then I need to keep preaching to these people. It's not about money. Okay? Okay. That's the whole point. This, that verse is talking about people who want the truth, who have a love of the truth, and they're applying it to their lives, and you see fruit, so you keep preaching to them. Not, do I see more money coming from them? The more money I get from them, the more I preach to them. That's not how it's supposed to be. They have a love of the truth, you preach to them. You preach truth to them. Acts 5, 16. Acts 5, 16. Be very careful not to misuse Scripture in the Bible. Okay. Acts 5.16 There came also a multitude out of the cities, round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk, and them 
which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Then the high priest rose up, and, the, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel, this is the one, but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Notice they weren't commanded to go back to the Sadducees and Pharisees, the people that put them in prison. They were told to go back to the people who wanted truth. That's where they were told to go preach the wisdom. That's where they were told to cast those holy commandments of God, the pearls before people who wanted it. Okay, It's not about getting paid in, in return. Verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened and we found no man within, now when the high priest and the captain of the temple of the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them where unto it would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. The people that wanted it and the people that didn't want it put them in prison. Did they go and preach to the people who didn't want it? No, they went back and was commanded to go back and preach to the people who did want it. They were seeking truth. Okay, that's the whole point. We're just going through some examples in the Bible of people that, hey, where they didn't cast pearls before swine, and what happened when you did cast pearls before swine? Okay, the Waldensians. Okay, I finally got the book on the Waldensians. I haven't read it yet. Um, but I've listened to people who've talked about it and who did, who have read it and did some teachings on the Waldensians. And bottom line, they had to go to, uh, to be an elder in the church. You had to spend, I can't remember how many years, two to three years witnessing in, Italy, in Rome, okay, around Catholicism. And you had to be slick. You had to make sure that you didn't cast your pearls before swine. Because they would turn around and rend you, especially in the heart of Satanville, if you want to say it like that. Satanism, the Catholic Church, okay? If you were caught, if you just went and stood there and go, I'm a Christian and I want to tell you the what, you'd be beheaded with, before the sun goes down, okay? You had to make sure to be careful not to cast your pearls before swine. Cast that which is holy into the dogs. That's why when we preach and teach about preaching the plan of salvation, God will open doors to you and God will close doors to you. He'll say, that person doesn't want the truth. Don't waste your time. Hey, here's an open door. This person might be ready for truth or you might be able to plant a seed. Here's an open door. Here's a closed door. Here's an open door. See, that's the whole reason we teach that. You don't cast pearls before swine. Okay. The same thing goes with brethren, trying to preach truth to brethren sometimes. I believe there's some brethren that are saved, that there's sometimes you go to preach truth to them, they don't want to hear it. They have a certain sin in their life that they want to hold on to, that they want to keep, and they don't want to give it up. And God has to work on it. The door is closed at that moment, and you're like, okay, they don't want it. I tried. They don't want the truth. You don't keep casting pearls before them. Now, I'm not saying they're lost, but I'm just saying there are certain situations where it's a saved brother or sister in Christ that you're trying to preach truth to, but they don't want to hear it right now when it comes to sin. But you don't cast your pearls before swine. You definitely don't cast your pearls before the lost world. If you come across somebody that you realize they don't want the truth, you don't force feed them. Okay? It might get hard for Christians again someday where we're being hunted down. If, we're, if we get to the point before the catch away of the body of Christ that Christians are hunted down again like they were in the past, they are still in some countries, but as they are in the past, I'm talking about for America, but some of those other countries, some of the brothers and sisters of Christ are in other countries where it's a lot harder being a Christian. They can't be it so hardcore openly. Okay, they got to be careful not to cast pearls before swine. You'll have to think twice before, okay, does this person seem open that I can witness to them? Or is this person... Have no love of the truth. 
You've got to talk to a person to see what their attitude is towards truth, what their attitude is towards sin, what their attitude is towards this world. Okay? you got to be a lot more cautious. Today, I can go out in the street corner, hold a sign up, and preach the plan of salvation here in America, and try to preach the truth, and everybody can laugh at me and walk by and just laugh at me. Nothing happens to me. But there might come a day that I won't be able to stand out there openly. I'll have to be like the Waldensians. They'd have scripture, like little pieces of scripture that they'd hide in their pockets. And when they found someone they thought might be open to the truth, in other words, they're not casting their pearls before swine or that which is holy unto the dogs, they'd take the piece of paper out and pretend like they picked it up off the ground and said, I just found this on the ground. It says something interesting. What do you make of this? Okay, that's what they did. Turn to Acts 23, 1. I keep telling people we're not car salesmen. I believe that contest is talking about lost people. That's what it's talking about. You're trying to preach wisdom to someone who's lost, doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them. You're trying to preach the commandments of God. What's the commandment for today? Obey the gospel. They don't want it. That's the primary. Instruction righteousness, even with brethren, when you get somebody who's very heated, they want their sin, they're not going to give up their sin. It's a sin issue, not a salvation issue. Okay, I tried. Lord, I give them to you. That's why the Bible talks about put them without. Those that are without, God judgeth. Those that are within, we judge. And then we put them out and say, God, I let you deal with them. Okay. Acts 23, 1. A few more pages. This is my big print Bible. <laughs> so when you go to do one chapter, it's like two or three pages sometimes. Um, and sometimes six or eight. But I love the large print for my eyes. Chapter 23, verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. Okay, he's been preaching truth to him, and now he's going to get smacked across the face for preaching truth. Do these people want truth? If they're willing to smack you across the face, are, do they want truth? No. Verse 3, Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Just a little side note here. You'll find that you have people, wolves in sheep's clothing, they prey on the ignorant. Through good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So you had someone who knew the law, knew that it was wrong to smack him, told somebody <laughs> who was ignorant of the law to smack him. And when Paul said, hey, that person was probably like, then why did, looking at that one person, why did you tell me to smack him? It's against the law, you know, that kind of thing. Smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, revilest thou God's high priest? Because because he corrected the high priest. These aren't people that want the truth. Verse 5, so what was Paul's response? Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. I wish he wasn't the priest. He's so wrong in what he's doing. I wish he wasn't the priest. Verse 5, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, in other words, he realized these guys don't want the truth. I'm casting my pearls before swine. They're going to rend me. I'm giving that which is holy unto the dogs. They're going to rend me. What's his, what's his response? He cried out in, a, in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. He puts them against each other. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. They turned on each other, started devouring one another. Verse 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees confess both. And there grows a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part rose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. But if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. They don't care what he said. They just care that he's one of us. You know, 
taken sides. And then when there arose great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should be pulled to pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Okay? These Pharisees and these Sadducees were preventing Paul from preaching. And if you keep reading, you see how Paul goes up there and gives the people one last chance where he gets to address all the people without being told to shut up by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So he tries to cast that wisdom that pearl, uh, the commandments of God, the gospel, obeying the gospel, that holiness, he tried to throw that out there one last time. But brothers and sisters of Christ, these people don't want the truth, so I'm going to put them against each other. You know how you can do that today, brothers and sisters of Christ? Don't fight them. Don't get into debates with them. Don't get into arguments with them. Just link the gospel message and move on. I had so many people that... I'm going to argue with him, and I'm going to make videos against him. I didn't give him the time of day. They make videos against me, I don't give him the time of day. Okay, they try to argue or debate with me. Here's the plan of salvation, and I move on. And they get bored of me. And what happens? You watch this whole group that attacks true Bible-believing movements. They start turning on each other and attacking each other. I mean, you had them come together to attack Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries, but when that got boring, they started attack. Like Brian went so, through some periods where he's getting work done and didn't put out as many videos, and it just got boring. And they started turning on each other and attacking each other, devouring one another. <laughs> okay, you want to know how you can do what Paul did? Don't argue with them. Don't debate them. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't cast, uh, put that which is holy among the dogs. Okay. Give, that, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Talk about the holy commandments of God. Okay. Don't do it. Uh, Acts 21 11, you don't have to turn there, but Acts 21, 11, And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. In other words, Paul, if you go there to try to preach to the Jews again after he said, I'm done with the Jews, they're going to turn around and rend you. But Paul had a great love for his people. He wanted to see them get saved. He wanted to try again. Even though he said, I'm done, he had a great love for his people. But we see they're, they're going to tie you up. They're going to turn you over to the Gentiles. And God used it for his purposes. Okay? Paul was able to go even more into the Gentile nations because he was captive and preach more. Okay? But the whole point is, is, if you go there and you try to preach the gospel, cast your pearls there, you try to put that which is holy, the holy commandments of God there, they're going to bind you. They're going to rend you. Okay, rending doesn't always mean killing. Okay, if a dog bites you because you didn't give him a treat, it hurts, but it didn't kill you. Okay, but oftentimes when a dog would rend you though, or I'm talking about a sow, those wild boars can rend you and really hurt you to the point of death. There are martyrs out there, brothers and sisters of Christ. There are men and women who have died preaching truth because there's a certain group of people that didn't want the truth. And while they tried to preach to people who did, there was people around who didn't. And they turned around and rendered them to the point of death. Okay? Don't forget the martyrs. But the whole point that, that this study is is that you need to be have a spirit of discernment and say, hey, is this person truly saved, or are they trying to pull me away and get me into arguing and debating? Am I falling into the trap of, if you're a man of ministry, are you falling into a trap where you're addressing the lost world other than to preach the gospel to them? You're challenging them. You're egging them on. You're mocking them. You're name-calling. Whatever. Are you falling into that trap of casting your pearls before swine? You need to stop. Plain and simple. Now, we don't, we're not going to go there, but how many times was Jesus going to be stoned in his earthly ministry? Where he came across certain people that, that, that wanted to listen, and then you had certain people that it was casting pearls before swine. 
He was going to preach to all the people so everybody's held accountable. But how many times was he going to be stoned for preaching the commandments of God, for preaching wisdom, the ultimate wisdom? You know, when Peter says, Thou art the, the Christ, the Son, capital S, Son of the living God. Called him capital L, Lord. God has shown you this wisdom because he was open to it. God has shown you this wisdom. But the world didn't want it. How many times did the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes try to rend him? Try to arrest him? You know? They would, and if you watch, because I didn't want to go make this too long, but if you go back and read, I'm going back through the Gospels now in my uh, listenings to Alexander Scorvey and talking to the Lord about everything I'm listening to. And you listen, it said a lot of times when, when Jesus had problems with the Sadducees and the scribes, he wasn't there to address the Sadducees and the scribes and the uh, Pharisees. He was there to, speaking to the people. And they were there overhearing. And then they tried to butt in and give their two cents worth, which isn't even worth two cents. Now, the number one person that will rend you, just to throw it out there, the no, that's why I keep telling you, don't get into debates and arguments with false converts. The number one person that's going to rend you is when you try to preach truth, absolute truth, to false religions. Okay, mainly false converts. That's the number one people are going to rend you because you're going to think, well, they say they're saved, so we're going to talk about the Bible. And when you get to the point that, hey, they're not saved, you don't talk about the Bible other than to preach the gospel to them. They don't want it, you go your way and let them go theirs. Okay, We know our way, where we're going, and they're deceived into thinking they're not going where they're going. Okay, But even with all the false religions of the world, that's where you're going to be rended the most. Not from some guy who's, an a even atheism is a, is a religion, but somebody who's, dare I really don't know if there's a God out there, I'm not really f believing in God, but I really don't know. You're not going to get rendered by those people that are just, and there's very few of those people today. But most of the people in the world are already claim, are clamoring to these false religions, atheism, uh, feminism, um, uh, the Catholic Church. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, all the different denominations and so-called Protestantism, which they're no such thing. They're all Catholic Church, closet Catholics, you know, Methodists, um, Presbyterian. I don't have all of them memorized, but Baptist, even Baptist today, non-denominational. I was always part of a non-denominational church and went to a Baptist church a few times growing up. But mainly it was non-denominational that I grew up in. Okay? They're all false religions. And if you try to preach truth to those people, nine out of ten times you're going to get rended if you don't have a spirit of discernment to say, are they really looking for the truth? If they're not looking for the truth, then I'm not going to bother you. I'm going to go somewhere else and give truth to people who do want it. Second okay. Peter 2.18 Why do I say this is talking about lost people? 2 Peter 2.18 I don't have this one highlighted yet in this book, but I will. I'll get it there. Verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. Now remember, I'm going to stop right there a second. First and second Peter, you got to be careful. It goes through a lot of different dispensations. And right here, I believe this dispensation that it's talking about is the time of Jacob's trouble. Remember that. Time of Jacob's trouble. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Though, through much wantonness, though they were clean, escape from them who live in error. Escape from them who live in error. In the time of Jacob's trouble... They're going to try to lure you through the lust of the flesh because it's going to be take the mark of the beast and worship the beast. And no man might buy or sell it except they had the mark of the beast. And if you look at how today is, the average person out there cannot survive without a grocery store. Think about that. Let that sink in. They don't live off the land. I try my best to live off the land, but even I, I have some struggles with it. 
if things got that bad. That's why I keep practicing today to learn to live off the land, fishing, hunting, growing crops, learning to forage. Right now I'm getting us salmon berries, then there's some blackberries, there's some mushrooms along the, the mountainside that you can pick out some mushrooms. There's a certain type of, it looks like a, a weed slash grass, but it's weird, but they call it miner salad. It's, it's, it's green that you can eat and it has like 90% of, I was shocked it had 90% of the minerals and vitamins that the body needs. It has a lot of it in just one plant. That's called a power food. <laughs> they say call power foods. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, you have the world, they, won't, they couldn't live without a grocery store. They buy all their food. They buy all their clothing. They buy everything. They don't make things for themselves. They don't go out in nature and pick things for themselves. They don't grow things for themselves. They don't hunt for themselves. They don't fish for themselves. So they're going to lure through the lusts of the flesh. You want to have fun? You can't even have fun. Remember, the word fun has to do with the flesh. Chapter and verse where Christians are to have fun. I got, I got hit up for that by the lost world. It's easy to believe them that they're all about the flesh. And I keep warning Christians, we don't use the word fun. Why? Because that has to do with the flesh. God gives us joy. He gives us peace. He gives us happiness. But fun is not a part of it. He doesn't want us having fun. Because what is fun? Fun is indulging the flesh. And the flesh is in charge. You're elevating the flesh, not the spirit. Instead of putting the flesh down, you're elevating it up and letting the flesh run one wild. Okay? But that's what it's talking about there. Verse 19. While they promised them liberty. We're going to talk about this again because I want to go over liberty again but um, in another study. But they promised them liberty. Oh, you can take the mark of the beast and be saved. Oh, it's not a big deal. They're even teaching that today. That you can take the mark of the beast and you can still be saved. They're promising them liberty. But what do they bring them? Death. They themselves are the servants of corruption. Okay? They're heading for destruction and they tell you that you, you can have liberty. And they try to get them to, in the time of Jacob's trouble to head to destruction. How do they get them to head to destruction? Take the mark. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. You can make it halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble. You can make it a year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Jesus could be coming back tomorrow. But you took that mark of the beast. The latter end, the latter end is worse than the beginning. Okay? I believe at the time, start of time of Jacob's trouble, it might not be too hard, but as you start trying to survive to the end, enduring to the end, it's going to get so hard. And you're going to go through so much nightmares if you go into that time period because you're lost. We're not. We're not going to go into that time period, brother and sister Christ, but the lost is going to go into that time period, and it's going to be the most nightmare of ever. And it's saying that you take that mark of the beast, all that nightmare and everything is nothing compared to what's going to happen now. Nothing compared to it. Verse 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they had the knowledge, they, they kept themselves from taking the mark of the beast for so long, and worshipping the beast, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. All that hard time they went through, nothing compared to the latter end. Where are they going to end up? The lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Verse 21, For it had better that for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after that they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. There we see holy commandment. Okay, I know we can use that verse for instruction in righteousness today, but I believe that's talk, it's addressed doctrinally at the time of Jacob's trouble. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. They lost their salvation. When they were lost, going into the time of Jacob's trouble, they're a dog, they're a sow. They're fleshly, that's why they refuse to get saved today. It's all about the flesh. A lot of them were lied to, but it doesn't matter. If you wanted truth, you would have gotten the truth. But you didn't want the truth. You loved being lied to because it was all about feeding your flesh. You're a dog. You're a sow. You get in that time period, you get saved with the knowledge. But it's no longer sealed until the day of redemption. 
in the time of Jacob's trouble. You have the knowledge, but you also have to keep the holy commandment. What's the holy commandment? Okay. Oh, real quick. Proverbs 26.11, when it says that uh, it has happened to them according to the true proverb, that's Proverbs 26.11, it says a dog returned to his own vomit, and so a fool returned to his folly. Remember, a fool said in his heart, there is no God. They returned to their folly. Okay? But doctrinally, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, what's the holy commandment? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You have to keep the commandments of God, that holy commandment. And what's the holy commandment? You're not to take the mark of the beast or worship the beast. That's the commandment there. And, um, and it says, the testimony of Jesus Christ. So doctrinally, like I said, I believe that's talking about people in the time of Jacob's trouble that returned to their own vomit. To her, sal that's for, to her wallowing in the mire, they lose salvation because they take that mark. They just can't stand it any longer. I'm going to take the mark. I'm going to take the mark. But for instruction and in righteousness, it's the changed life. Okay. Did you truly give your life to Christ and go back to the and go back to the world? Nobody who truly gives their life to Jesus Christ, that's born again, can go back to the world. Paul tried to warn people, but the people he was warning about not resurrecting the old man, he was warning the Corinthians, people that he was calling out saying, if a man be called a brother, I don't know if you're a Christian. I've had to preach the, I mean, think about it. You have to preach the gospel multiple times to people that are supposedly saved. But Paul believed they're all saved and just carnal Christians. No, he did not. He doubted their salvation. He said, guys, you're not supposed to be resurrecting the old man. Okay. What's the commandment today for a Christian? The holy commandment. We're to obey the gospel. Okay, We're supposed to obey the gospel of God. What happens to them that obey not the gospel of God? The Bible says they go to hell. So the, the holy commandment for today is you've got to keep, uh, you have to obey the gospel. You have to get saved. Okay. So instruction and righteousness, you can look at that and say, okay, you have some people that have head knowledge, but you can tell that they're false because what's their attitude towards absolute truth? You have all these false converts. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. I'm one of you. I'm a Christian. And what do they do? When you start preaching the truth to them, you start casting pearls before them. You start casting that which is holy unto the dogs. Obeying the gospel. True evidence of salvation is the changed life. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. The new man is raised up. There's no new man. You're dealing with the sow. You're dealing with the dog. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't cast that which is holy into the dogs. You're seeing them. They come to you and they, oh, I'm a Christian too. But when hardship comes, they change their mind. Because it's all up here. They change their mind. You can't change your heart. You change your mind. Okay? Your heart can get hardened and it wants nothing but the world. Or your heart can be like, I'm looking for something and this world doesn't have it. There's something wrong with this world. There's something wrong with me. I just don't know what it is. It's just something's wrong with me. And your heart is seeking truth. And it seeks the Lord. Okay? You have hearts that start to seek the truth, but then they start going the way of the world and they get hardened. I just want the world. Okay, I'm not saying you can't get saved. Anybody has an opportunity to get saved. But the point of it is, the instruction righteousness for that is, it's the changed life. Okay, you look at them and go, okay, is there a changed life? What's their attitude to absolute truth? Well, I love absolute truth. No, they're saying they love absolute truth. When I say, what is their attitude towards absolute truth? I'm talking about the life that they're living. What kind of life are they living for Jesus Christ? And does it line up with this book? When I was newly saved, it took God two years to, to really clean up my life because I held on to some sins and wouldn't let it go. Okay, I struggled with the Lord when it came to certain sins in my life. Kept trying to find excuses where it's not really a sin, it's okay, it's not really a sin. When it was. 
Okay? I'm not saying God's going to clean up your life overnight like that. It's going to take time. But you're going to see that in a brother and sister in Christ's life. When someone's newly saved, they're going to be like, Oh, if that's sin, I need to get that out of my life. Oh, I failed the Lord, brother. I fell back into to temptation and chose to sin again. I'm struggling with this. That's the marks of, of, of someone who's truly saved. A love of the truth, and they're putting the flesh down according to what the Bible says is sin, not their feelings and opinions. You have someone crying, oh, I don't believe it's sin. Well, let me show you the scriptures. I ain't listening to you. You're gonna be, if you try to force feed them, you're going to be casting pearls before swine. Given that which is holy unto the dogs. You realize that, hey, I think I'm dealing with someone who's a false convert. Right. 2 Timothy 3.1 Go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 3.1. I decided I'd try to turn to the scriptures this time since we're setting down. <laughs> I love setting down and preaching versus standing up. It just hurts my back and my legs to try to stand up for long periods of time in one spot. Um, Walking is fine, just standing in one period hurts. One spot hurts for a long period of time. 2 Timothy 3.1 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're, we're, getting close to the, we're getting close to the catching away of the body of Christ, brothers and sisters of Christ. How we know? Verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. You know the biggest... When I see people try to just, justify sin, it's all about themselves. It's love of self when they're trying to justify sin. Okay, be careful about that. Uh, covetousness. We see that a lot today. Boasters. Proud. Pride is just out of control today. Blasphemers. How many false converts are there out there professing to be saved, but they truly, they're truly they really blaspheming the name of the Lord and His Word with the life that they live? Well, I'm a Christian. We're all Christians. Half the world's population is Christians. And there's people who profess to be Christians and they use the Lord's name in vain all the time. But I'm a Christian. Yeah. They, they claim to be a Christian, but they're using Bible perversions. Blaspheming the word of the Lord. Alright. They attack this book. The King James Bible. God's perfect written word for English-speaking people. Okay, disobedient to parents. But in America, can we say, yeah, we see that everywhere? I hardly see any kids anymore that are obedient to their parents, that honor their mother and father. Right? I say I hardly do. Okay, Honestly, the only one I can think of in my head to just pull out of my head is Brother Brian's son, Oliver. When we see him, he obeys his dad. There's times in videos where his dad said, stop doing that, and he stopped. Come sit over here. He sets. Do this over there. Okay, But disobedient to parents... Kids are being raised, you're your own man, your own woman, you can do whatever you want. Your parents can't, don't have to tell you what to do. They watch Hollywood movies and it's all about, you know, teaching them to be independent but rebellious against their parents. It's all that junk is, the Hollywood TV and movies and TV shows and everything. It teaches them to go against their parents and hate their parents and fight against their parents. Oh, I love my parents. My parents let me do whatever I want. That's not love from a parent. That's hate from a parent. Letting a child do whatever they want. All right. Verse 3. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This would be to parents. Unthankful, unholy. Remember, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Unholy. They don't want the commandments of God. Without natural affection. Sodomy is out of control in this world today. Just completely out of control. Truce breakers. False accusers. We see that left and right today, especially among professing Christians. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. That's key for this scripture, for what we're talking about, casting your pearls before swine. You're going to have people that are despisers of those that are good. I thought, didn't think it would happen. I think it would take a while to happen to me. It didn't. But I had someone blatantly tell me, oh, you're just trying to be holier than thou. You're so self-righteous. On and on. They're just so self-righteous. What is that? Despiser of those that are good. Be ye holy as I am holy. 
the holy commandments of God, the Holy Spirit comes in, opens this book to me, and I, I'm given commands. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Avoid uh, profane and vain babbling and science of opposition of science, falsely so called. These are all commands, brothers and Christ. Fornication, avoid fornication. Uh, drunkenness. You're to be sober, be vigilant. Okay, these are commands. But they're going to be despised of those who are good. Because as we start growing as a Christian, we start obeying the word of God and saying, Lord, open the scriptures to us. We want to obey them. Our life changes and we start looking good. We're supposed to have good fruit as Christians. Not bad fruit. Good fruit. Not fake fruit. <laughs> good fruit. I remember, remember that study we did together. If you don't, I have a video where we talked about the fruit. And you have fake fruit that's poison. It's not real. And you have bad fruit that's gone bad, and you've got good fruit. Okay, we're supposed to have good fruit. We're supposed to be good. But they're despisers those that are good. When you come across someone who despises those that are good, be careful that you're not casting your pearls before swine. It's not talking about, and we'll get to it here in a second, but it's not taught, I'll say real quick. It's not talking about people who want the truth that don't donate. That's not what that's talking about. That verse is talking about people who don't want the truth. All right. uh, verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded. We've had a lot of traitors in our midst, pretending to be Christians, and when the time is right, they turn on you. Okay, heady, high-minded. And here's the second one for this study. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. First time I read that, I read that several times. I've highlighted it, it's memory verses and stuff like that. But that's the first time it hit me. It said, wait a minute, it says that they do love God, though. It doesn't say they hate God. They do love God. You're going to have people in these last days that profess to love God. And somewhere in their heart, they do love God a little bit. But they've chosen the world. They are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They start out, okay, Christian might be cool to be a Christian. It might be cool to be a Bible-believing Christian. It sounds good. I do love the Lord. I do love God, and I kind of want to do what's right by God. But in the end, they choose the world and reject Jesus Christ. Okay, they don't speak evil of Jesus Christ. This is those those people. They don't speak evil of Jesus Christ, but they're not living for Jesus Christ. There's no new creature in Christ Jesus. They don't obey the commands that God gives, Jesus gives. Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. Then he also goes on to say, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if, if you do whatsoever I command you. They don't speak evil of Jesus, but they're not obeying the holy commands that he gives. They're not obeying his word and keeping his word. Five, having a form of godliness. They don't say bad things about him. Some of them even pretend. They do all this religious stuff and everything and pretend. Have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They don't want truth. Ever learning, but they don't want the truth. The truth. Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus Christ. What does Jesus say? Sanctify them through that truth. Thy word is truth. They don't want Jesus Christ, and they don't want his word. Don't cast pearls before swine. Hebrews 4.12. If you want to pause and turn there. But Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrows, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why they don't want this book. It tells them, for, shows them for who they are and what they are. And they don't like it. Dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. You say, well, that was pretty harsh. The way you said that was pretty harsh. It's got to be said that way, brothers and sisters of Christ. 
You don't come to an, an, oh, you're a sinner, but it's okay. Sin's not that big of a deal. It's okay. God loves you. That's not how we're supposed to be presenting the gospel. You're a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on your way to hell, and you deserve to go to hell for sinning against God. But you know what? You don't have to go to hell. God pro provided a way out. Do you want to know what that way out is? What's their attitude towards being a sinner? You tell them you're a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner, and they hang their head and they're like, I am, I'm just wicked. My life is just wickedness. Well, let me show you. Now they're in a spot where you can say, but you don't have to go to hell. Let me show you how to, where God provided a way for us to go to heaven. But you hit that person up that, who are you calling a sinner? You self-righteous, you trying to be holier than that. You're talking to a dog and a sow. Don't waste your time with them. They're not broken. Okay? This book points out their every sin. It knows the thoughts and intents of a heart. And they don't like it. Move on. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All good works. When I go to correct a brother in Christ, or a brother in Christ goes to correct me, it's done out of love. Why? So the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. So our relationship with the Lord doesn't get hindered. Okay? But remember, that scripture I believe is talking about lost people. When you're trying to preach instruction righteousness to someone who's lost, and you try to force feed it to them, they're going to turn around and rend you. When you're trying to preach doctrine to someone who's lost, they might be saved, but here's the point. If they're saved and you're preaching doctrine and they were lied to and taught a false doctrine, the Holy Spirit in them is going to bring them into all truth. They're going to know truth when they hear it. Okay? They're going to know truth when they hear it, and God's going to bring them to the truth. I'm talking about those people that hold fast to false doctrine. You can lose your salvation in this time period, the church age. Not the time of Jacob's trouble. Today, present tense. Okay, the, the dispensa dispensation that we're in today, the church age. Okay, um, they believe in a post or mid-trib. And no matter how much preaching you do to them, they're not going to listen. When you realize they don't want truth, you stop. They don't want the truth. Godhead versus the Trinity. You try to preach the Godhead. They don't want the Godhead. They don't want the true Jesus of Scripture, who is God the Father, fully and completely God, which is the Father. That body is connected to the soul. They're not connected by a title of capital G God. If you've ever seen the stupid I, uh, uh, pagan diagram that these professing Christians draw, where they have God in the center, and then they have uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they're all connected together only because they're all God, but there's no connection to each other on the side. God the Father is not the Son. Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. That's Satanism. When you say Son of God, it's, connect, it's saying that Jesus, the Son of God, is connected to God the Father. They're one and the same. The soul, the, the body, that's the difference. That's the distinction. Body and soul. But they're connected and treated as if they're one because they are. But they take away the connection. But the point is, you try to help preach truth to them, what's their attitude towards truth? Well, they don't want the truth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you want to get a lot of the, I'd say, misery out of your life, because that was brought to my attention that if I preach against sin, I, I'm a miserable man, and I'm trying to cause other people to be miserable. No, we want your walk with the Lord to be good. But we're also trying to preach truth to you. But you want to get a lot of the misery, the stress, I'll say stress. You want to get a lot of the stress and the, and the painfulness out of your life? The number one thing you can do is make sure you're not casting pearls before swine. If they don't want the truth, let them go. And you will have peace in your life and joy. Okay? They'll come and try to steal that peace and they'll come and try to steal that joy by trying to get you into debates, get you into arguments, get you to fight, get you to address them, to give them recognition. You know, the, the drama that goes on on YouTube. 
They want the recognition. That's the whole point. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into a ditch. Okay? God will deal with them. Put them without. God judges them that are without. God's going to judge the lost world. We're to judge brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to preach the gospel to the lost world and let the lost world know that they're sinners, which is a judgment, and that they're on their way to hell, which is a judgment. But that's God judging them. We're just warning them of God's judgment upon them. But when it comes to actual judgment and holding people accountable to this book, we're supposed to be doing it to brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, that's why it says put them out. God judges them that are without. They're lost. Throw them out there and let God judge them. God, you'll deal with them. And he has. Right. So, that's it for this study. I just wanted to encourage the brethren to not misuse that verse. Okay, but also take that verse to heart. If you're still getting into fights and debates and arguments with lost people that don't want the truth, don't, don't waste your time with them. Okay? Now, real quick, before I leave, uh, the, stop the video. Um, on the flip side, what I'm seeing people also use with the verse is they're trying to use that verse to try to say that brethren are supposed to be donating. You're not supposed to be casting your pearls before swine that don't want to donate to your ministry. Be careful not to misuse that scripture. Okay? Bottom line, if there's somebody that wants wisdom, which is what the pearl is, wisdom, uh, understanding, instruction, that which is holy unto the dogs, the commandments of God, if someone has a love of the truth and you're preaching to them and there's fruit there and they're not giving a dime to your ministry, so what? I'm talking it on the men in ministry side. Not the person who's not given the dime, but on the ministry side. So what? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I'm only supposed to preach depending on how much I get paid. Be careful not to fall into that trap. To the brethren that are in ministry, be very careful not to fall into that trap. If they love the truth and they want the truth, and they expect more truth from you, do your best to give it to them. Do your best. Sometimes they can be taxing. They want Bible studies every hour on the hour. It's like, we can't do that. As brethren. I only put out one or two studies a week because I want you to go through the study, and I want you to pray about it. I want you to apply it to your life and talk with the Lord throughout the week about the studies that we go through. That's why I'm not just cramming study after study after study down people's throats. Okay? Um... It needs time to digest, in other words. You take in the study, your food, feeding the church of God with his purchase with his own blood, and it takes time to digest. Okay? So I want you to think this hard. Am I doing this in my life? Am I trying to force wisdom, the word of God, on family members that are lost? Friends that are lost? Co-workers that are lost? Neighbors that are lost? Am I getting online and getting into fights, debates, and arguments with people who are lost about the Bible when I should be just preaching the plan of salvation to them and then letting them alone? But I'm warning the brethren in ministry, if you come across some people that are asking for more teachings, they want absolute truth, there's good fruit there, you keep preaching to them. There was times that Paul didn't take a penny. There was times where Paul didn't receive a penny. What do you mean by that? There was times where they, there's groups that didn't have money. Okay? The whole teaching we did talking about being content, you know, the three things that ruin that can ruin a walk, a Christian's walk with the Lord, uh, cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, and lust of other things. That study we talked about, deceitfulness of riches, where just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And Paul's sitting there saying, these people, one time he came to these people, they didn't give him anything. The next time he came to these people, they gave him in abundance. But he said, he had to still correct himself and say, but I've learned to be content with whatever state that I'm in. Okay? Paul, it didn't matter if he got paid or not. If they wanted the truth and there's good fruit there, you give them the truth. Period. Now, if there's no fruit there, move on to somebody who does have fruit. You'll notice that a lot of times the people who don't have fruit, they are trying to waste your time. And they are wasting your time. By all means, don't give them, the, give them the time of day. You've already given them the time of day. In other words, go to somebody where there is fruit. 
You're planting seeds, and now you're looking to see if there's fruit when it comes to a minister trying to preach the Word of God to people. Do you want the truth? You don't want it? I'll go to somebody who does. Now, on the flip side, brothers and sisters in Christ, please understand, if you have a ministry that their primary source of income, food and raiment, the primary source of income, I have to throw that in there because you look at the world today and all these millionaires and I always say millionaires, but you see all these pastors that they're living way better than the, the people in the congregation in these Babel buildings. They're living way better than the people in... No. Food and raiment. Okay, be content. That's what Paul said. Be there with content. And he's talking to a man, a young man in ministry. If you want to be very effective for the Lord, you're going to have to learn to live mediocre to poor. You don't want to be rich. All right? But if you have a ministry that helps you grow good fruit and helps you with your walk with the Lord and everything, and you've got something as simple as five dollars, you know, all I have is this five dollars this year. I'll even say something as extreme as this year, five dollars. By all means, donate to a mis to ministries that have blessed you. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. Muzzle. The ox has a right to eat. Has a right to be clothed. You know, taken care of. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. By all means, please be donating if God's blessed you with extra money. People always hit me up saying, why aren't you opening up? I want to donate, I want to donate. Brothers of Christ, God's got to be taken care of and I'm not trying to steal rewards from you in any way, shape, or form. I've told brothers and sisters of Christ this. If you really feel so God's put it on my heart. I need to donate this money. God gave me a big chunk of money. God gave me just one dollar. He's really put it on my heart to donate to your ministry. I have a P.O. box that I put up on the ministry. You can donate through that if God's really put it on And write a letter to me so I can hear from you. How are you doing? Testimonies, that kind of thing. prayer requests. Write me a letter. Send a little money. Fine, if you feel really called to do that. But I always try to encourage the brethren that there are men in ministry out there that their sole primary income is donations from the ministry. And sometimes they don't know if they're going to make it to the next month or not. Because they're living month to month on just donations. That's a tough life. I used to live that life where you lived from paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And there was, day, there was months that you were broke within the first few days once you paid all your bills, the rent. Okay, I paid rent. I paid a car payment that I shouldn't have had, but I was lost. Uh, you pay all these bills, and by the time everything's done, and you bought the food for the month, and you replaced any clothes that were falling apart, there's, there's months that I was broke within the first few days of the month, because I made sure to make all my, sure all my bills get paid in the first few, few days of the month. It's a tough life. I wonder if you're going to get from month to month to month. Okay, That's what these people are doing, these, bro these brothers in Christ out there that are preaching and teaching. Okay. They don't know if they're going to make it to the next month, but they trust God. And that's what they need to do. Brothers, sisters, brothers in Christ that's out there in ministry, I almost said brothers and sisters. Brothers in Christ, you need to learn to trust God. Okay, God will take care of you to be content with whatever state you're in. Brothers and sisters in Christ that aren't in ministry, if God's blessed you, please, by all means, donate to ministries that, that need ministry. Don't be one of those people that just sat there and, oh, I've learned a lot from... Brother JT, I've learned a lot from Brother Brian, I've learned a lot from Bra Brother Brad Avenshine. I've learned a lot from these brethren, but I haven't given a dime to them, and I'm living great and having all this fun stuff, fun. Um, but, you know, extra stuff. Living, ab I'm not living poor, in other words. Okay, when God blesses me with a little extra money, I try to donate too. I can't afford a lot of stuff, but I do try to save now. The Lord's helped me cut back. I cut my own hair. That saved me 25 bucks a month. Uh, I've learned to, you know, grow my own food, hunt for food. People always say how much money they spend on meat. I hardly spend any money on meat anymore because I've got a freezer full of fish. I've got a freezer full of bear meat. You know, God's helped me cut back. And that little bit of money that I'm saving, I'll, I'll donate it. This ministry helped me out. That ministry helped me out. I have brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not in ministry, but they're struggling. I'll donate some money to them when the Lord blesses me with be having more than abundance. Okay? I'm using me as an example not to put me up on a pedestal. I'm sorry. I don't have a lot of money. 
I can't donate a lot. I apologize for that. But when God does bless me with being able to donate, I do. And that's the whole point I'm pushing to the other side. Men in ministry need to learn how to be content with food and raiment. And on the other side, the brethren need to, to... The Bible talks about when you're overly blessed, you need to give. When God overly blesses you, you need to be sharing it with the body of Christ and helping those that are less fortunate than you. The lost world takes that and misuses it. But we as brethren should be doing that. You have a brother in Christ over here that's having a hard time. Well, my jacket that I'm using for work... It's a really nice jacket, but I can't afford another one. And then all of a sudden in the mail, they get a jacket from a brother in Christ saying, uh, Blessings to you, brother. I heard you might need this. I decided to get you this jacket. You know, that's just a scenario, okay? People needing Bibles. I've sent Bibles to people. I've sent books to people that wanted the truth, okay? I've helped brethren out when I can. That's the whole point, when you can. If you can't, Prayer, brothers and sisters Christ, prayer. Pray, pray, pray for the body of Christ. Pray for those of us in ministry that we stay the course and we don't fall to the right or fall to the left. We don't let sin in our lives. Because I've found out in my life, when I let sin into my life, my choice, my fault, I failed the Lord, I failed the brethren, it affects my ministry. It affects fellowship with the brethren. It affects my walk with the Lord. But those men in ministry, pray for them. That's the best thing. That's the number one thing you need to be doing, whether you're donating or not. You definitely need to be praying for them every day. I pray for Brother Brad Abishine, Brother Brian, Brother JT, and other men that are trying to get in, into ministry, men that have kind of dropped off and kind of disappeared. I pray for them, and I say, Lord, I don't know what happened to them. Lord, I pray you help them get them back, their walk with you back on the right track. Maybe we'll see a video from him again. 33rd Book. I don't know his real name, but the channel's 33rd Book. I pray for him because I wish he'd put out more videos, but he puts out videos when he, when he feels God's put it on his heart, so there's times in between where I'm just hoping he's okay and I'm praying for him. I wish he'd get his book back out, uh, back out to print so I could get his book. Uh, he has a book called The Embarrassing Bible that he once had in print, but now it's not in print anymore. And he, God's really helped him and doing some amazing teachings when it comes to the Bible. But I'm getting kind of making this a lot longer video than it should be. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the point is, is don't misuse that scripture. By all means, uh, preachers need to be content with food and raiment, and by all means, brethren that have been blessed above their means need to be helping out the other brethren, and they need to be supporting good ministries. But that verse there about casting pearls before swine in the King James Bible, it's not talking about that. Okay? It's talking about lost people. When you realize you're dealing with somebody that's lost, instruction righteousness, even if it's a brother in Christ, when you, because I said, it's like doctrinally it's talking about lost people, but for instruction righteousness, even if you're dealing with a brother or sister in Christ where you're trying to preach truth to them, you believe they're saved, with all your heart you believe they're saved. They've had a changed life. They believe the major doctrines. They believe the King James Bible is God's perfect word by the life that they're living, but they get into some sin in their life and they start holding on to that sin and they don't want to let it go. That applies there for instruction righteous. You try to preach truth to them, and when they say, I don't want to hear it, you go your way and let them go theirs. Okay? Don't get into fighting and debating and arguing with people. That serves no purpose except to bring you down and bring your flesh down. I've seen people who get in debates, they go into the debate hardcore standing for truth, and then halfway through the debate, because they're a babe in Christ, they get so confused. Well, now I'm confused. That was the whole point that they were trying to do. They were trying to get you confused. You don't debate. Debate is a sin. You don't argue. Arguing riles up the flesh. That's why you got all the drama going on around people arguing back and forth. It just riles up the flesh. That's what a lot of the TV shows get into, the, the flesh shows. They're all about drama, arguing, and fighting. It's drama, 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 drama. We're not supposed to be like that, brother, says Christ. Stay true to the Word of God. Stay true to each other. Okay. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.